and invited me to be a lecturer for the Tombow uh, Club meeting. And I checked the list of previous lecturers, and it's an impressive list of people and a lot of interesting subjects. I'm honored to have the opportunity to be a presenter and be added to the list of the Tombow Lecture Series. So I'm going to dive into the partial phase phenomena now. And these are all the things that are related to the sun being slowly covered by the moon. And some are unique to eclipses. All right, so the final partial phase phenomena is shadow bands. So everybody's heard about shadow bands. Shadow bands are the fine little low contrast gray shadows that can get projected onto the surface of the earth when there's a fine crescent. Now, you have to realize what's happening from the, the space perspective. When there's a fine crescent and the moon is blocking most of the sun, you have this column of light that is going around the side of the moon and coming to Earth. And out in space, it, there, nothing happens to it. It doesn't get perturbed at all. But when it hits the atmosphere, that's when it can get altered to make shadow bands. Now, shadow bands happen basically inside of two minutes, really inside of 90 seconds before C2, and then till about 90 seconds or 120 seconds after C3. And it's because the, the sun is becoming a very, very fine crescent. And you know, at a very, very fine crescent, 60 seconds before totality, it's almost not a crescent at all anymore. It's, it's a slit. It kind of doesn't have a banana shape anymore. The reason this is important is a slit of light coming through the atmosphere is more likely to be refracted or in some way modified to have kind of the wave front theory of adding up subtracting waves. But the other thing is your ambient lighting at your observing site has to be dim enough that you're going to see shadow bands because they're very low contrast. You can't see them if it's bright out. Shadow bands may get created sooner, but you're not going to see them at the observing site because it's too bright. So when you look at an eclipse math and uh, map and you see the umbra, I want you to think about it a little bit more detailed. Think about what totality is, but also think about right before totality, there's a crescent phase. And right after totality, there's a slit or a crescent phase in the sky. And that's what can create the shadow bands that you can see before and after totality. So the theory is that somewhere in the atmosphere, that slit of light is being, is being perturbed in some way. The going theory really right now is that it happens very high in the atmosphere at the height that we as astronomers would think causes scintillation of, of stars. I actually think, and I'm going to talk about this in a minute, I actually think it happens lower than that. And uh, let's, let's talk about why in a minute. You're going to see a lot of eclipse books use this analogy of the bottom of a pool being close to what shadow bands are all about. And I think this is a horrible analogy because shadow bands look nothing like the light that gets reflected from the surface of a pool of the pool water to the bottom of the pool. They're doing this because they want to talk about the concept of refraction or light you know, passing through two layers of different density. The thing that scares me about this analogy is if you are an eclipse novice, and you're looking for shadow bands, they are not random lights on the bottom of the pool. They're in rows of very light gray, uh, light contrast shadows. And if you're looking for this, you're not going to see it. And I, I recognized this in 2019. In 2019, I had a white sheet out. We were seeing wonderful shadow bands before C2. People who knew what to look for were seeing them. People who didn't know what to look for were looking at the same sheet and not seeing them. You have to understand what you're looking for. If you understand the pattern you're looking for, you're might more likely to pick them up early. And if you're thinking about the bottom of a pool, you're, you're lost. But anyway, here's the concept of the bottom of the pool. This is what they're trying to relay with that information is that the waves at the top of the pool can refract the light. And there's some areas at the bottom of the pool where the light is added and some areas where the bottom of the pool where the light is subtracted. But again, it's, it's messy. So let me tell you about what happened in 2017, which was a little bit of work and a little bit of luck. I was working with NASA in, in, during this eclipse to prepare people for shadow bands. And I happened 
to be able to come across video of shadow pans in three different places in this eclipse. But the important thing is that they were all oriented to the path and oriented with a compass. So site A was a NASA student um, uh, at a NASA site in Kentucky. Site B was a guy who watched one of my videos on shadow bands and reproduced my experiment. And site C was me. The, and the interesting thing about this is nobody's ever had three eclipse videos or shadow band videos from the same eclipse that were oriented. The shadow bands in these three sites behaved completely differently on the videos. They're completely different. In site A, the, the NASA students video, the shadow bands were in rows like they usually are, and they marched in the direction of path exit. These are simulated, obviously, on the sheet. They marched in the direction of path exit, and the little shadows kind of leapfrogged each other, which they sometimes can do, in the direction of north. At site B, what was interesting that happened is at second contact, the shadows were perpendicular to the path and they moved in rows towards path exit. But after totality, the shadow bands shifted about 30 degrees. So the angle on the sheet shifted about 30 degrees. They still moved in rows towards path exit or umbra exit, but they shifted in angle. And at my site in C, my shadow bands were parallel or perpendicular to the path, but they moved in the completely opposite direction. They moved towards the direction of, path, of umbra approach, which I never would have um, believed really. So I, that's why I think shadow bands are created at a level denser than the levels of the atmosphere that uh, create scintillation because they can actually move an angle the the slit of light to a large degree you have to remember too about shadow bands it's not a local effect you're seeing them locally on the sheet you're watching them at but they're happening where the slit of light is going through the atmosphere so for a high eclipse they're happening miles away from you but a little closer than a low eclipse because of the geometry those shadow bands are going to be happening in atmosphere that's many miles away from you. And that's why shadow bands in a low eclipse are actually longer. Shadow bands in a high eclipse, the little shadows are shorter because it's related to the dimension of the slit starting at the sun. But when they come through the atmosphere at that long angle, they get elongated. So to get more information about shadow bands, you'd have to do this complex kind of experiment where you had video at a site and you had a, side, a SkyDAR um, unit downrange somewhere. You'd have to figure out how far downrange based on the altitude of the eclipse. But this unit can measure and monitor the motion in the different layers of the atmosphere. So you could correlate what's happening to the atmosphere where the slit is coming through the atmosphere to what's happening at your eclipse site.